so that everyone who is on the outside can sort of tune in. Um, what we're going to do today is basically we're going to finish off what I started two weeks ago when I introduced the regulation of sexuality and then really didn't deliver the full story, so to speak. Um, I think we kind of ended up with the uh, uh, historic sort of timeline that I introduced in the first two sessions. Um, and we're going to sort of finish that. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of formal and informal forms of regulation. And then we're going to move on to kind of the situation nowadays with the question of how is erotica consumed and produced and kind of regulated nowadays. Um, you had a kind of a sort of a very brief uh, kind of task for last week. We're going to probably not manage to kind of go through that this week but we're going to start off with that next week so for those of you that haven't really managed to kind of had a look at it at the scene and as you know the the forms of regulation so to speak in this scene this is something you can do next week or until next week okay um first before we start are there any questions that we should deal with right at the moment all right good then we're going to start with regulating sexuality. So basically what I said kind of the, the se or last session was that there has been this sort of moral hierarchy of certain forms of sexuality. We have the good kinds of sexuality and the bad kind of sexuality. And what I sort of the argument that I made was that this is sort of um, very much tied to the historic sort of, um, regu not regulation, but the historic development of certain discourses of sexuality. Um, and these discourses of sexuality, and there has been quite a number or quite a bit of work on it, um, that people have sort of I managed to frame sexuality as being first and foremostly about power. And this sort of relationship between power and knowledge and sexuality is something that we've explored because each of these historic developments and each of these historic discourses that we sort of looked at from the medical perspective uh, to the sociology perspective to questions of psychoanalysis, all of these knowledges produced about sexuality also have social implications in the sense of some people are able to be sexually active and some are simply not, simply because of the knowledge is being produced by these discourses. So this is why we should look at these sort of historic developments in order to see how did we end up at this very point that we are right now at. Um, and the history of sexuality, I'm just going to very briefly move on. Not yet. There's... No, I'm going to move on. So this is basically where I left off with this sort of um, historical overview and I said that we're going to be sticking with that in some form. It's very, um, very bright. I'm just going to, not quite sure if that helps if I switch off the light. Um, it might help, might certainly help for you. I'm not quite sure if, uh, if, if I'm still visible. I'm this kind of shadowy presence now um, online, so that's totally fine. Okay, but this is sort of where we are still at. And these are still really important sort of cornerstones if we look at sexuality, but not only if we look at sexuality, but also if we look at the sort of regulation of sexuality. So what this has left us with is a moral hierarchy of sexuality on the one hand, and a sort of medicalization and sort of a pedagogization of sexuality. So sexuality is only something we can easily talk about if it's couched either in terms of education or in terms of sort of scientific medical uh, discourses. Other than that, sexuality is still a bit of a taboo topic, so to speak. It's, it's this one of these either or principles. It's either good or it's bad. And usually it's kind of still this dirty um, secret that no one really talks about, especially not in sort of the public sphere. And how this happens is something we're going to be looking at in a moment. So what I'm going to do now is sort of go through the 19th century and you might be thinking, why are we starting the 19th century with something historical again? That is mostly because all the issues we have with sexuality nowadays and with the regulation of sexuality is something that, broadly speaking, stems from the 19th century. So all of these issues, if, if you look at sort of domesticity and middle class ideals, all of that kind of starts in the 19th century because this is a period with where a lot of social, cultural and political changes happen and we still feel the remnants of that still nowadays. 
it seems far-fetched, but is unfortunately the case, as you'll see in a moment. Um, so sort of, if we talk about regulation in general, and I'm not quite sure if I asked that, but let's, uh, let me ask that again. What forms of regulation of sexuality do you know, generally, if you think of, you know, any sort of erotic or sexuality you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the age of consent is pretty important. So uh, that's usually 16. In some uh, countries, it's 18. In some countries, it's 21. In some countries, there is no age of consent. But generally, yes, age of consent is one of the um, forms of regulating sexuality. What else? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, Broadcasting codes, it's usually that. Um, they regulate sexuality pretty tightly um, with PG ratings, etc., etc. Yeah? Yes? Yeah, maybe like representation in media? Yes, absolutely. How, how would that regulate sexuality? Uh, like maybe not showing it. Um, to see, like, if you not, don't show it, it's a kind of like a taboo thing. Like you don't really see it, it doesn't really happen. So it's kind of this. Yeah, something that is implied but not seen. Um, usually, if you, if you look at regular films or television series, especially if you look at you know general traditional television series, they usually cut away right before the act. So you would see a closing bedroom door, or you would see someone kind of inviting someone else in, but it wouldn't go further than that. You usually see the before and after, but not the the act in between. Yeah, what what other forms of regulating sexuality? Yes. I mean, maybe regarding that point, um, you also have uh, limited time to show sexual content on TV or something. Yeah. Um, what do you think? What time is that, roughly? Usually, like late in the night, from maybe eleven or twelve o'clock to in the morning, some, something like six o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's or that that sort of breaking point is called the watershed. Before the watershed, there is no nudity, there is no sexuality on screen, or at least not in the sense of that you see full frontal nudity, for instance, especially not male full frontal nudity. That's generally a complete no go. Um, but the watershed is usually around nine o'clock. After that, you have a little bit more leeway. But you know your programs, your films need to be in this particular space from 9 p.m. to roughly 5 to 6 p.m. in the morning. Um, I think the uh, Ofcom Broadcasting Code notes it as where children and vulnerable people are least likely to watch. So there's that. Um, where else? How else can you regulate sexuality? Yes? Um, by the laws proposed by government. Yeah, laws, absolutely. That's um, a very formal way of regulating sexuality. So um, do you know any laws uh, apart from the age of consent? Uh, yeah, actually, in the country I come from, there is a law which prohibits to be basically a gay. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the criminalization of homosexuality and other forms of um, unorthodox sexualities. That's part of regulating it. Uh, also, prostitution laws, for instance, are one form of regulating sexuality. There was also another raised hand, and then I can kind of ramble on. Yes? Um, maybe in school. So yeah. there's only the talk about like, pregnancy and how to get pregnant or like, not. And then all the STDs you have to know about, and then nothing about pleasure. Yeah. Also nothing about menstruation, nothing about all of that. It's just... Um, also nothing about gay sex, so it's... <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think the church plays also a gigantic role in regulating sexuality um, because they exclude everything that is not heterosexual or normative. Yeah, heteronormative, usually that's, that's you know, if, if you're straight and you have sex, that's totally okay, unless it's before marriage, then it's also a bit mm, iffy, but generally, yes, religious and so-called moral institutions do play still a huge role, and I would still argue that our understanding of sexuality, especially because you, you mentioned um, sex ed in, in some form, um, these ideas of essentially purity culture, you know, you shouldn't have sex because it's, it's super dangerous, you can either get pregnant or you get STDs. So 
that's terrible. And this sort of ties in with a, a sort of Christian morality, with this sort of idea that though religion doesn't really matter, some of these moral ideas and these ideologies are still in there somewhere. They're still important to be essentially abstinent from sexuality because it's this sort of inherently dangerous kind of thing. Um, anything else you can think of? <laughs> Seems not to be the case. Oh, yeah. Maybe also in family or like close friends? Yeah, because absolutely. Like with family is usually like, yeah, we don't talk about that. Maybe you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, friend or partner or something, but whatever you do when you're alone, please don't tell us. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's the idea that community, peer pressure, family, um, the uh, sort of the collective right around you does in some form impose certain norms of sexuality upon you. Um, particularly good uh, example with the family, usually your attitudes or your earliest attitudes of, uh, concerning sexuality, concerning nudity and so on and so forth are formed in the smallest level of society that is the family. Um, later it's with friends, so there are certain, certain normative ideas about um, sexuality in your friend group, in your immediate um, social circle in a way. And in, I would argue also in particular friend groups are, especially in teenage years, are very interesting to look at when it comes to the regulation of sexuality, in particular along gender lines, for instance. So homosocial male environments regulate sexuality in a completely different form than homosocially female um, sort of environments. And that has to do with the idea of, you know, is sexuality okay for girls to have? Is sexuality okay for boys to have? That's one differentiation, and then there's the question of, is sexually, uh, sexuality all right for teenagers in general, because they're often seen as these vulnerable groups, not children essentially, but also not adults. So that's um, very, a very iffy sort of uh, topic to talk about um, concerning children and uh, teenagers and sexuality. Um, so all of these points that you've given me are mostly both or can be differentiated basically between formal and informal ways of regulating sexuality. Formal is, of course, the age of consent, any laws on prostitution and unorthodox sexualities. Um, sexual education is kind of on the border between informal and formal because it is certainly something that society regulates by um, something not only sexual education but also questions of birth control, uh, the availability of certain medical interventions from birth control to abortion, these things are certain, uh, certainly used to regulate sexuality, questions of censorship in visual and sort of uh, textual media, those are forms and they are quite at the border between formal and informal because they are certainly influenced by the state but they are also kind of influenced from the bottom uh, to top processes. And then there are of course the informal ways of regulating sexuality that is sex ed in the family, that is peer pressure, that is the community you grow up in, so more localized forms of regulating sexuality. Um, I'm going to say regulating sexuality very often, I've just noticed that. Um, but moving on to the 19th, or basically before we're moving on to the 19th century, one form of regulating that I just want to point out is the question of moral panic. This is something that quite a number of people have stated is one of the driving factors behind certain legislations, for instance, where there was some form of moral panic about something that is in a way connected with sexuality. It sounds super, kind of not very clear, but what I mean with that is, for instance, um, in the 19th century, again, the 19th century is a particularly fascinating time. I'm not actually interested in that time, but with certain regards to sexuality, it, it becomes really fascinating. Anyways, but in the 19th century, you had a moral panic, or not so much a moral panic, but certainly a... Um, People were very concerned with the working class, right? I mean, if you've attended, you know, history up until 12th grade or something, you might have heard of Friedrich Engels and the condition of the worker in, in England and how he describes that. So this was one of the social questions, so to speak, in the 19th century, what to do with the lower classes. And 
the lower classes had a particular set of weird rules attached to them. And some people, mostly from the middle and upper middle classes, thought that not only were those people kind of stupid and also a problem socially, politically and culturally, but they were a problem um, with regards to sexuality. So there is one particular... Ah. There is one particular quote I want to show you. It's the, to put it bluntly, sexual promiscuity and even sexual perversion are al almost unavoidable among men and women of average character and intelligence crowded into one room flats of slum areas. So what not only, and we're talking about a very particular sexual perversion here, namely incest. So there were a number of um, tracts, a number of studies being written that incest and other sexual perversions were most likely to occur amongst the working classes because they were in those very small rooms in slum areas. So basically they said they're all forced in together, so there's just nudity and sexuality everywhere, which is super weird. And right now, if you look back upon it, you go like, really? I mean... Probably not the case, which it wasn't, but there was this, this huge outcry in a way that this was a, a thing we, or the 19th century, or people in the 19th century needed to be looking at. There was this problem of incest, of pedophilia, of prostitution that would most likely occur in these working class areas. So people sort of took that as a reason to enforce and impose different rules upon the working classes, force or rules of what, and I'm going to mention that in, in a while again, of respectability. There were certain things that the middle classes did not allow other people to do simply because they posed or imposed their own norms upon these classes. And one of these sort of uh, rulings was uh, that incest was eventually ruled out in the 19th century uh, in the Criminal Offences Act because there was this idea that particularly the working classes would be engaging in these forms of sexual perversions. So there's that. Um, but moving on to the uh, sort of uh, historical sideline or line in this case, um, there's also the quote on the moral panic, namely um, it's from a book written by Jeffrey Weeks. He writes about the regulation of sexuality and he notes that moral panics in particular are a very valuable and fruitful tool in order to regulate sexualities. And he notes that societies appear to be the subject every now and then of two periods of moral panic. Uh, we see the same thing in the 1980s and 70s with regards to the AIDS crisis, for instance. Um, a condition, episode, person or group of persons emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. A moral, uh, the moral barricades are mend by editors, bishops and politicians and other right-thinking people. And here I'm not saying politically right-thinking people, but the good kind of right kind of people. Um, Socially accredited experts pronounce their diagnoses and solutions, ways of coping are evolved or more often resorted to the condition then uh, disappears, submerges or deteriorates. Sometimes the panic is passed over and forgotten, but at other times um, it has more serious and long-term repercussions and it might produce changes in legal and social policy or even in the way which societies conceive themselves. And we're going to get into that when we talk about um, particularly homosexuality, which um, was eventually regulated by certain decriminalization and criminalization acts. In, and here I'm going to focus in particular on the UK in this case. All right. Um, Moving on to the 19th century. So the 19th century is in particularly important and we've talked about that because it is sort of the area where sexuality becomes medicalized. But also it is the period where middle class ideas or bourgeois ideas of family and domesticity and respectability sort of develop. So um, when we look at the 19th century, we have a on the one hand, and I said that already, a very much male-centered and male-dominated structure. So sexuality is pretty much okay if you're a guy. If you're a woman, then your sphere is domesticity. And the 19th century introduces something quite interesting that is, and of course it's not really an introduction as in it had never been there before, but of family and a particular kind of family with the wife being sort of the social status that any woman should aspire to. 
And the 19th century regulates sexuality in a very interesting manner. It doesn't say, you know, sexuality is completely no go, but it says sexuality is okay if it happens within a marriage, if the marriage is loving. So we're not talking about lower classes. They're, of course, always connected to sexual perversions, but so are the upper classes. So is the aristocracy. So the 19th century has often been seen as sort of the birthing or the, the birthplace or the, at least the time of birth for the middle classes because suddenly there's a lot more affluence for a broader spectrum within society. And this is exactly not only sort of the, the, where the middle classes develop but where the middle classes sort of attain their economic, their social and their cultural power. And this is really important because with the middle class comes this idea of idealized domesticity with, you know, the wife at home and a couple of children and they're all well behaved and they're definitely absolutely desexualized. And the woman actually is too. It's mostly lie back and think of England and that's it. But it's still okay because lie back and think of England, you, you, you know, you're doing your job for the nation. That's totally fine. You... It's not really about female pleasure at that point. It might be very much in private, but generally not in a public discourse. But sexuality needs to be couched in these domestic ideals. It needs to be couched in a loving relationship and it needs to be done for procreation. So if that happens, sexuality is pretty much all right. However, with the regulation of sexuality or with the placement of sexuality within the domestic sphere and only in the domestic sphere, that also means that everything that lies outside needs to be regulated even more. So everything that isn't, you know, placed in a loving relationship, um, everything that isn't middle class is generally considered to be problematic and needs to be tightly, tightly regulated. And you can already see it's the Contagious Diseases Act, which I'm going to very briefly focus on. So the Contagious Diseases Act is actually an act um, to combat venereal diseases like syphilis. Um, this is generally, you know, a good thing, of course. It's a medicalization question and it's a criminalization question. But the problem is that the idea within the 19th century is that these contagious diseases do not simply stem from something, but they stem from a very particular point, namely from prostitution. And so this sort of act is used in order to regulate prostitution and extramartial affairs in a way. So everything that lies outside of the domestic female sphere is connected to vice, to uh, sexual perversion, and needs to be contained. And there are a couple of ways of containing it, un um, one of them being sort of a disease act, which doesn't really target it, the people that actually spread the disease, namely in this case men largely, um, but it targets certain areas within the city, for instance. Covent Garden in London is one of these um, places that is targeted heavily by the Contagious Diseases Act, which basically means that there's a lot more police force, a lot more surveillance, a lot more people looking for respectability, basically. Because with this sort of domestic focus came the idea of middle-class respectability, of a proper family, proper husband, proper wife, etc., etc. All of these issues sort of regulate prostitution in the sense of that prostitution isn't illegal in the 19th century, despite what people might think. It is pretty much all right. It is also accepted in a way. Um, you're going to, you're watching the, the clock. I'm just... Um, no, just if, if um, I'm running over time, just kind of raise your hand, tell me to stop, and then we're going to move on, because then um, uh, I tend to, as you know, ramble. So basically, uh, going back to prostitution in this case, but this is sort of one form of regulating it, and the targets are usually working class women unsurprisingly, and they are sort of pushed to the margins. So with these focuses on, on idealized questions of family, domesticity and respectability, there are certain areas in cities that are being marginalized to a degree that these um, are sort of targeted with a lot more police force, with a lot more laws, and um, I'm not calling them un, you know, places without the law, but there are certain places that are heavily, heavily regulated, not always you know, um, in a manner that is or that makes sense in the sense of, you know, they are not targeting prostitution and, and making it illegal, but they're certainly pushed away. And of course, within these sort of areas, 
uh, venereal diseases, for instance, spread far quicker and they are far more um, problematic in, in the long run or for, for society in general. Okay, um, just, I'm, I'm just, uh, give me just a second. How much time do we have? We are ending at in an hour, right? Okay. Um, because I, I promised that people could do their presentation, I'm just going to very, very quickly uh, wrap this up. I usually, I'm just going to click through. You know, I'm not going to give you all the quotes, but I'm going to very briefly give you uh, a couple of uh, comments on it. So this is sort of a, a very brief, <laughs> brief history of the regulation of sexuality. And I de definitely chose the right um, colors which you can perfectly see. Uh, but generally, I wanted to, to look at the Wolfenden Report, the Obscene Publications Act, Abortion Act, uh, Sexual Offenses Act, and Evolution of, Se of Censorship Act. That's a lot. Um, but if I, if I have to sum it up quickly, um, there, is, there are a couple of things that I want to point out. So first, I have said quite a number of things already on the question of domesticity and family. And this is something that moves or goes through the entire regulation of sexuality. So I said already, when we look at regulation of sexuality, children should not be targeted with nudity, with sexuality. That's completely not the case. Also, often vulnerable groups are female or older. So everyone who is basically not middle class, and uh, I think there's one lovely comment um, in one of um, the, the books basically on the question of regulating sexuality that says, you know, if you show it on BBC Two, then nudity is totally fine because the people can appreciate nudity when they watch BBC Two. But BBC One and Four, mm, sorry, no, you're just too dumb to obviously appreciate nudity and artistry. So if it's done well, in the sense of if it's a quality thing, then sexuality is okay, because it has the question of, you know, you need to have a certain class background or an educational background to appreciate it. If you don't, sexuality should be regulated, because then you obviously lack the certain, the, the cultural capital, so to speak, to appreciate it. And these questions of appreciation are not only class questions, but they are certainly um, questions of respectability. So sexuality should not be shown in full because it's sort of this carnal thing. It has to do with bodies. It usually has to do with fluids. And that's kind of eh. So we're not showing that. We show a sanitized way of it so that middle class people, people in a family can watch it together and not be offended by it. So every time we talk about the regulation of sexuality in some form, questions of domesticity, of respectability, of family values, of classness and classness always play a role. It always matters where do I look at sexuality, who is allowed to be sexual, who is allowed to speak about sexuality, where is it allowed to speak about sexuality. There are certain spaces where Talking about sexuality isn't really a thing. You don't talk about that in the cafeteria because people might be offended. You might talk about that in a seminar because that's fine. It's an educational context. I can do whatever I want because I'm couching it in the form of education. Um, but generally, um, also in the family, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just very brief side note. I'm writing my PhD topic on the sexuality of older people. So try talking about that in a family or in a family sort of celebrational space. I think I did that once because my cousin blurted out, so you're writing about older people having sex? And everyone just turned around going, are we related to her? Can we just, hmm? So that's just a no-go, simply because sexuality is seen as something kind of offensive, because it doesn't really conform to these values of domesticity, of respectability. It's just not something you talk about. And while this is, you know, we have come a long way from the 19th century, all these issues are still there. And they still influence sort of the way we regulate sexuality. The Obscene Publications Act is, um, is going, or is sort of reformulated in 1964, but it was written first in 1853. So it's in there for, or sort of still in, as, as used as a law or as an act for over a hundred years without anyone changing it. 
And there are a number of acts that are still being in place. Sure, they are being rewritten and all of that, but they are still kind of in place and they still sort of go back to values that were held and have sort of held on from the 19th century onwards. Um, that was very brief. Are there any questions? No. I steamrolled over you. Very good. So <laughs> this is uh, potentially the perfect moment to move on to um, our group who is going to be introducing you to sort of erotica and sexuality. Nowadays, um, we're going to need one minute or so to kind of set it all up and then I'm going to switch back. Ich wollte eigentlich nicht direkt damit an. Ich wollte eigentlich erstmal, dass Sie das ja, ja, auch, uns, uns äh, können, aber ja. Es geht nicht das so. Ist, oder? Wo muss ich drauf drücken? Auf den? Auf F3. Okay. Um die Frequency switchen dort hoch. Ähm, also entweder da okay. oder ihr macht es. Nee, nee. Muss ich das trotzdem da hinstellen oder wie machen wir es jetzt nicht? So, ich richte Ihnen das gerade mal ein. Ich muss es einfach nur mal. Sollen wir uns dann hier mit hinstellen, dass wir das Wort verfolgen können? Ja. Oder ähm, wäre das am besten für Sie? Ja, das muss ich jetzt mal ganz kurz noch einrichten. Ich würde Sie jetzt einfach erstmal hier hin positionieren, ja. wenn Sie sich ungefähr jetzt hier bewegen. Ich glaube, ich bin ein bisschen groß dafür, wie ja. Sie es eingestellt haben. Ich ah, müssen Sie einfach ein bisschen in die Knie gehen. Nein, das ist wirklich. Das steht 20 Minuten so da. Aus. Äh, das ist das vielleicht ein bisschen so. uncomfortable <lacht> für Sie. Würde ich jetzt mal fast vermuten. So. Ist das normal, dass das ähm, Haben Sie schon eingerichtet, dass Sie da noch etwas brauchen? Moment, wahrscheinlich ja nicht.
Ja. Ich kann jetzt auf Ihrem Laptop machen, dann müsste ich mich bei Ihnen aber auf Netflix einloggen. Das habe ich mir fast gedacht. Okay. Können wir auch gerne... Und ich mich auch gerne... Ach stimmt, das muss ich auch nochmal machen. Oder wir machen es dann einfach nicht. Also wenn ich nicht rankomme, dann mache ich es nächste Woche auch nicht. So. Ich muss nochmal ganz kurz testen, ob das hier funktioniert. Oh, das nicht funktioniert. Perfekt. Dann steuere ich das von da. Dann sehen Sie, dass auch wo Sie sind ungefähr. Na? Also wirklich. Es dauert immer eine technische Universität. Mhm. Und die Technik funktioniert mhm. wie immer. Exzellenz-Uni. Ja. Es gab, es gab vor ein paar Jahren mal so ein Schild irgendwo bei der berufsbildenden, äh, bei berufsbildenden Schulen. Exzellenz ist etwas anderes. <lacht> Und ich muss sagen, leider. I don't disagree. <lacht>
sie eigentlich stammen. Okay, let's start now, finally. <laughs> so, uh, first up, we have a little link here for you. Okay. So much for that. Yes, Mr. King. Ah, okay. So uh, you can scan the QR code and then we have the handout for you. And a small disclaimer, uh, we are going to show some sexual content and if you don't like that, you should maybe not look. But I don't know, if you're at this course, I think, yeah, if you're at the seminar, I don't think you'd have a problem with that. Okay, so... So I want to show you a video first and... Oh. Um. Sie müssen noch ganz kurz dazu sagen, das ist hinter Ihnen tatsächlich. Sie müssen da kurz hinter sich. Ich muss ein bisschen nach rechts noch mit dann schauen. Schauen Sie kurz hinter sich, dann sehen Sie ziemlich ganz hoch. Ja, ah, okay. Genau da. Okay, just a moment. Oh, das ist... Ja, ja. Okay, okay. Ja, das wäre nice. Yeah, and just just watch it, watch the video and collect your thoughts, and then I will ask you about it afterwards. So, okay. That's good. No. No. Um, so. This a bit You know what? Yeah. We're going to do that differently. Because we can. We can actually just watch the video. The the the, the sound isn't that important. This, okay. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, at least. But for you, for probably us, not. It's quite important to have sound. Okay. Then. I have that in my phone. Okay, that's not helpful for the people. No, but um, I can't, can't uh, show tone uh, audio anyways on YouTube, so that doesn't matter. Okay, now this worked. All right. Okay, so now watch again and just forgot that you've already seen it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what are some of your thoughts on the video? Do you have any? Okay, uh, I just, I'm just going to assume that you probably sexualize these scenes, despite them not being sexual at all. And this happens because of the way we are, we are kind of made, and how society influences our view on sexuality. So we've seen uh, scenes or situations that are, that are kind of similar to those depicted um, and we have a sexual uh, yeah we just think sexually when seeing them so we de we immediately think okay this has to be sexual also they use some shortcuts in the video uh, like different camera angles and the facial expressions of the guy also could imply that uh, it was actually meant to be sexual and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, today we're going to talk about um, yeah, erotica today, how it's, how it's consumed and just sexuality in general. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me talk about the structure for a second. First, I will talk to you about society then the role that social media plays on sexual representation as well as music. Clara will talk to you about written media and 
Uh, Chiara will talk to you about visual media later. So, society. Um, in general, gender and sexuality have always been important uh, topics in society because we're always surrounded by sexuality, even just uh, advertisements, even just in advertisements, you will always find some sexual content. It's just a daily topic that surrounds our everyday life. And uh, our view of sexuality is based on biology, so our genes, and, as, and also social cultural influences like personal needs, desires, or uh, activities, practices, emotions. Yeah, so society establishes sexual norms and expectations and we, the people, the individuals, we adapt to them during the process of socialization. So we kind of know, okay, the norm is to be a heterosexual and, well, we don't adapt to them. We don't have to adapt to them, but uh, yeah, we just get to know them and we just know what is, what is seen as normal and what is not. However, this view of sexuality changes over time, as we've seen previously with the different regulations, for example. Yeah, so the influences uh, vary per individual because everybody is exposed to different information. And uh, I've named some of those influence factors for you and I will give you an example for each of those. So the influence factors can be biological, like just our genes, psychological, like the way we view our own sexuality or how others view our sexuality, social, this can be basically everything, our peer groups, advertisements, social media, music, TV, everything basically. Uh, economic would be things like the price of um, the price of things in the sex shop or the price of uh, porn, for example. Political things um, could be like uh, the gay rights movement, which started in 1945. Cultural things would be um, globalization, the Kama Sutra. Legal things would be uh, the regularization of sexuality, which we talked about before. Religious would be the church that says you can't have sex before getting married and spiritual would be just the individual beliefs a person has. Yeah, uh, in, 19, in 1940s and 1950s a study was conducted that showed discrepancies between these social, the, the social sexual norms and expectations and what is actually happening. For example, same-sex masturbation was way more common than people thought. So in that respect, it's very important to raise awareness and that is what sexual education should be for. It should be about self-awareness with your own body, tolerance and non-discrimination. But often these important topics are missed and it's in school, as we've talked about before, sexual education mostly just focuses on the biological aspects and leaves out uh, important information which can cause some serious problems because some teenagers might get their information from the internet or from peer groups and this information can be misleading and yeah lead to some problems like for example the objectification of women. There are also some other problems that are caused by sexuality like prostitution, sex work in general, um, controversial topics like abortion and so much more. When it comes to porn consumption, 90% uh, of men and 60% of women uh, consume porn on a monthly basis. And mostly it's uh, either written, it's pictures or it's in video format. Um, the sexual activity actually decreased in the past 15 years, uh, which, could be, um, which could be a result of the awareness society has given sexuality in general. In streaming providers, there are way more LGBTQ characters than there have been uh, years before. And just in general, the number of people identifying as LGBTQ has doubled in the course of the past 10 years. And this could also be due to the fact that the awareness for it just grew, especially when we look at social media, which we will talk about next. So most people, about 60% of the population uses social media and mostly it's young people who use social media. 
and they often don't have a lot of experience, they don't have a lot of knowledge about sexuality. So the influence that social media has is the biggest on younger people. Um, yeah, there's some positive and some negative aspects uh, about the influence of social media on sexuality. Positive aspects would be that it's very easy to access information and you just have the privacy of being able to search for everything you want to search for. You can ask questions and you can answer them, maybe even anonymously. And there's a relatively free expression of sexuality in, on social media, which kind of evokes a feeling of freedom and acceptance. And in general, you just there's just a depiction of many alternative lifestyles, different sexual orientations and different gender identities even. So it just feels more natural to you when you look at those kind of things every day and you don't feel ashamed if you maybe also want to live an alternative lifestyle. However, there's also some negative uh, influence. Because everybody has access to social media, there are some hate cultures for example, on Telegram, there are a lot of groups that are anti-gay, anti-LGBTQ. And in general, you just have the over-sexualization of the human body on social media because we're just used to sexualizing uh, bodies, so we automatically sexualize them. Uh, yes, um, for example, if you look at an Instagram photo or at a TikTok post, for example, like with a Kim Kardashian post, we just it's just a picture of her, but we immediately sexualize her because she shows her breasts and she shows part, parts of her body. Um, also, it sets the wrong standards because of course you're exposed to a lot of different lifestyles, but in general, what you will find most on social media are uh, heteronormative images. So in general, you just have a more, the focus is way more on the value and desirability concerning sex and gender. And also social media um, raises some other gender issues. For example, when talking about the breasts, males can show their bare breasts while women can't. Um, yeah, uh, or just in general, when um, women post pictures of them maybe drinking or something, they will be judged way earlier than men would. Uh, okay, so the influence this whole influence doesn't come from just anybody, it comes from the users, it also comes from the platform owners, designers, celebrities, advertisers, so basically everybody has kind of an influence on social media. However, there are also other risks involved when looking at social media and sexuality. For example, some people uh, portray a wrong life or they don't portray their actual life, they just fake their online presence. Also, there's hookup apps, which can be very da dangerous. And sometimes um, they have unsafe settings. Uh, yeah, but a lot of social media sites actually changed some of their settings so that you can now choose any gender you want, not only male and female. So while social media is something that influences mostly younger people, there's something else that basically everybody is exposed to, and that is music. So basically everybody listens to music, whether it's your favorite streaming service like Spotify or Apple Music, or some people might even enjoy listening to, to the radio still. Um, yeah, it has, it has a very big influence on our view of sexuality and gender, because we're exposed to so many different perspectives of sexuality and sex and everything. Because the creators themselves, they have the chance to express their own sexuality and thus the consumers, they are influenced by their, by their experience. So um, there are so many different, different views that you as a consumer can look at and that can influence you. As I've said before, for every individual it's kind of different. It's also kind of different what kind of music you listen to. Yeah, um, music has actually always been seen as something sexual. In 1936, Theodore W. Adorno wrote in his book Über Jazz that the rhythm of jazz music is comparable to the rhythm of um, sexual intercourse. I don't know how true that is. Um, I wouldn't agree, but okay. Uh, yeah, the perception uh, of... Um, no, uh, let me start again. So, um, back in the day, 
homosexual homosexuality wasn't as well uh, represented in music and because the or change of non heteronormative or our view of non heteronormative relationships has changed over time because of different movements or identity policies which led to more lgbtq artists coming to the front for example there's a song by Rosier it's called take me to church where he talks about gay marriage and i don't think that would have been possible 50 years ago yeah um what i find very interesting and very important about music is that it influences society but also music itself is influenced by society so therefore i would say that music is a very strong indicator when talking about the view of sexuality uh, that society has so um, when talking about music, there's three main components I want to briefly talk about. It's the visual component, the musical component, and the lyrical component. Okay, so first, uh, the visual component. The visual component mainly means um, there's accompanying music videos, um, which also use shortcuts, as you've seen with Rosanna. Uh, and I just want to give you an example of how, uh, how the view of sexuality has developed over the last couple of years. So first I want to show you a clip from 1992. It's uh, the music video for Erotica by Madonna. And I just want you to think about um, the sexual aspect of the music video and I want, to, want you to uh, ask yourself the question if this is too sexual. Okay, that's unfortunate, but just forgot you read that. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't mind. Just um, make it close to Yeah, exactly. Close. Yeah. Because I, I think you, you yeah, open I, it twice. So. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't mind listening to it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what are your thoughts? Do you have any thoughts on that, or? Okay, I just tell you about it. <laughs> well, if you if you don't talk to me, I have to talk to you. So uh, handling this is kind of a mess. Okay, so mm, yeah, so actually, this music video was banned for being too sexual in 1992. So basically, um, they showed it on MTV like three times, but all of those were uh, were at uh, like after 10 p.m. But after three times, they said, no, this is too sexual for TV. We just take it down. And yeah, so the views really change over time. And I'm going to show you another music video um, from last year by Lil Nas X called Industry Baby. Some of you might know what's coming now. Um, and I want you to ask yourself the same questions. Is this too sexual? No. Okay. Okay. Do you want to talk to me now or <laughs> It's fine. Or okay, okay. So um, yeah, this actually was not banned, but I think we would all agree that um, 
this depiction of sexuality is way different than what Madonna did in 1992. And while it, while it was controversial and people talked about it a lot, it wasn't banned and it was kind of more accepted. It provoked um, a discourse and I think it just became more natural to talk about sexuality today than it was in 1992. Yeah, yeah that was just kind of an example to show you uh, why music is such a good indicator for the view of sexuality. Okay, so the musical component, I just want to briefly talk about that. Uh, it's about the sounds of the melodies, the rhythms, the beats, or just unique sounds. Often when songs want to sound um, sexual, they use kind of dark beats. Just an example for you, uh, there's a song by Whale called Bad, where he has a squeaking bad sound. So it's just, you just hear the for the whole song and you immediately think about sex because that's just an association you definitely make. Um, and another song is called WAP. There's a beat throughout the whole song where they say there's some horse in this house and just repeats itself over and over again. Um, yeah. So that's the musical component and lastly the lyrical component. So songs also tell stories via the lyrics. There are some songs that talk about sex or just love. And I, I'd say there are two different approaches to sex when looking at lyrics. And I just want you to read through these passages and maybe you have some thoughts you want to share with me. Okay. So somebody wants to say anything, or should I just talk? Okay, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. It's a presentation, so I don't, I don't, I can force you to talk. Um, yeah. So I think it's very obvious what I mean by this, uh, but just to make it a little bit more clear. So the sexual view is, it talks directly about sex. You have, you have um, references to different positions. You have also have some subtle hints or metaphors, for example, swipe your nose like a credit card. I mean, what does that even mean? What does it mean? But if you look at it in a, in a sexual context, it's kind of clear it's referring to uh, oral sex. And it's just uh, throughout the, this whole paragraph, we have different, different metaphors and direct references. And with a romantic approach, it's more uh, about the love side of sexuality. Every touch is ooh la la, and uh, but <laughs> but um, but it also references sex directly, or it, or it's very clear that it's it talked about sex, like locked in the hotel. Why would they be locked in the hotel? Are they playing cards? I don't know. Um, and uh, friends don't know the way you taste. I don't know. Is, is, are they licking each other or are they kissing? I think it's very obvious what's being portrayed here. Okay, so now we talked about some lyrics and how, um, yeah, how just text form can show you sexualities. And that's why I'm giving the word to Clara, who will talk to you about sexuality in written media. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, um, I ask myself a question. How does the medium uh, of the written medium influence the representation of sexuality? Well, um, a minute ago, we saw that even in lyrics, there are huge differences. And of course, uh, this topic is handled very different, differently. Um, it really depends on the author. Um, because there are no really restrictions. Um, some authors prefer to use metaphors and others just go straight to the point and describe everything in detail. Um, but the fact is that literature leaves room for interpretation and imagination because there are no pictures usually and this makes it very exciting. And the next question is, why does literature matter when it comes to sexuality? Well, um, of course, literature 
can be a representation of sexuality. It can it, it can normalize uh, sexuality and just raise awareness to the topic. And of course, it plays part in transmit, transmitting a society's culture uh, because the openness of a culture is really depicted in different media, as we just saw in the examples Norman gave you. And it also plays a role for the development of teenagers, because in teen fiction, in teen um, romance novels, for example, um, fiction offers opportunities to imagine sexual intimacy and to consider the emotional consequences without really having to live them all in real life. And talking about teenagers and developing, um, we're coming straight to the next topic, which is sexual education. First, I've got a quote right there. It says, everything we read constructs us, makes us who we are. And uh, I don't think this means that uh, literature is the only source that shapes us, but um, literature can partly be a condition children, uh, wait, sorry. Literature can partly condition children to accept the way they see the world and um, they can provide the opportunity to inform themselves um, about alternative role models and can help to be more open regarding the whole LGBTQIA plus uh, topic. Um, but sexuality in fiction is actually often depicted in a normative way. Uh, the ideology of heterosexuality remained very implicit and unquestioned, unquestioned uh, which means that children are actually innocent of sexual desires and intentions while they are also assumed to be heterosexual at the same time. I mean, it's ridiculous to look at the baby and just say, oh my god, you are a heterosexual, I can see that. So, um, this whole topic seems a little ridiculous when thinking about it. Um, yeah, but when growing up, children, they learn that um, growing up involves traditionally gendered expectations about adulthood and sexuality. And the youth is a period in which children become sexual, and it's not only a biological process. For example, becoming a woman is more than just a biological process. Uh, there is an overlap between physical, symbolic, and social conditions, and all of them are very um, important. I found some pictures of sexual education books. On the left you can see the cover of a book which is called Hair in Funny Places and on the right it says Mummy Laid an Egg, um, which is again just ridiculous. I mean they try to be funny in a childish way but it's not really mature I guess. <laughs> um, What's also important to know here is that sexuality in the context of sexual education is often connected to fear and danger uh, when it comes to STDs or having sex too soon and inappropriate touching and so on. So uh, it really connect sexual desire and feelings and activities with fear and danger, and I don't think that's a good thing. I just want to remind you real quick of uh, the, de the definition Ms. Röber just provided for us in the second um, session. Part of it said, it is a term, sexuality is a term that indicates any combination of sexual behavior, sensual activity, emotional intimacy or sense of sexual identity. So what we can see here is that uh, sexuality and sexual education should really not just be about the biological process or the physical process that everybody goes through while hitting puberty. Um, sexual education should also be about tolerance, variety and so on. Um, and talking about variety, 
there is actually a platform that is really known for variety, I would say. Um, I'm talking about WordPad. It's an ebook platform that was founded in 2006, and there you can upload uh, stories and also read stories from other users. There are actually more than 2 million authors on this platform, more than 70 million users and more than 565 million stories that have been uploaded until last year. <laughs> um, so, as you might know, if your story gets famous on Wattpad, there is actually a chance that um, it will be published as a book or even serve as a template for films or series. An example for that is uh, the after series. And another very popular topic are fan fictions on Wattpad. You can find fan, fan fictions about literally everyone and the biggest group of fan fictions is about uh, One Direction or also Harry Potter and something like that. Um, I brought an example of Loki with me and I just want you to read that real quick. Okay, um, while reading this, what were your thoughts? Is there anything special about this text, maybe? <laughs> yes, please. Why would you censor this week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, the person writing this literally wrote you out of his dick, but like, pussy is too, too much for this story or what? Yeah, that's what I was asking myself too. Um, it's really weird, but um, Wattpad is actually a platform where you can find a lot of weird things. Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, please. Also, that it's the type of story with you, so that's not that has no character. Mm -hmm. So it's a really that you can put yourself in the most kinds of say. I think they say Y slash M also. I don't know. It's the, uh, you can insert your name. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So here we can see a quite unusual perspective of storytelling, I would say. And uh, it also becomes evident there that the author used um, a very colloquial language and, as you already said, used an emoji instead of the actual word. <laughs> um, yeah, but. As I said, there is a huge variety of stories and topics and also writing styles, and that's what Wattpad is known for. Um, what you also might know is that there is a very famous story that is also based on a fan fiction. I'm talking about Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, it is actually a trilogy published in 2011 and it's about the 20-year-old Anastasia Steele uh, which meets the who meets the 27-year-old Christian Grey who introduces her to the world of BDSM dominance and bondage and these books and also the movies are really well known uh, over 150 million copies have been sold and uh, the books have been translated into 52 languages and as you might know, it's also well known in Germany. Um, there is actually a German study uh, and they asked people to list some erotic novels and 81% of them listed Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, they also called Fifty Shades of Grey a prototype of the contemporary uh, erotic novel because it contributed to social acceptance of erotic novels and um, can be seen as an inspirational source for other authors. And 
the most important thing about this whole topic of Fifty Shades of Grey is that it seems scandalous at first, but on the other side, there is a huge demand for erotica, and Fifty Shades of Grey has actually been a lot criticized for fetishizing these domestic and sexual abuse, uh, because one in five women experiences domestic violence in her lifetime, which is a lot, and critics argue that these books actually normalize uh, this violence. But now let's have a closer look and read an excerpt. But first I want you to log in into Menti. Uh, you can either, either use the QR code or um, just click on the link you're here online or use the code yeah okay there are some questions wait mm. god where can i find this now yeah okay Okay, so these are the first two questions. What do you find interesting, surprising, shocking, etc.? And what comes to your mind while reading this? And I'm going to show you the big this. <laughs> um, oh. Okay, just read along, please. Okay, so now you can just type in some of your thoughts into Menti, that would be great. And I'm going to show you the results <laughs> in a minute. Okay, what I can see here is um, multiple times possessive, dominant, uh, disgusting, and what the fuck. Um, I find shocking that the text is only about male pleasure. Yeah, that's right. No pleasure for women. Uh, focus on him, not her. Yeah, okay. I guess you all got the point. Um, Oh, that's a lot, actually. Wow. <laughs> hey, thanks. <laughs> um, no room for arguments. It's for me, not you. Yeah, the dominance. Doesn't seem like both partners are equal. Yeah. Um, seems like he doesn't respect her. That's a big point. And here, down there, abusive and controlling, all about him. Yeah. So I guess now you can see what I just um, tried to tell you earlier with uh, the do domestic abuse and so on. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, I guess that's what um, a whole lot of us thinks while reading this. Yeah, but there's actually a second question I prepared. I just 
Where can I find it? Oh my god. Okay. I can't find it. Can you go back? Like, you know, Hmm. No. Ja, das ist schon das, aber ich kriege mich nicht kontrolliert. Hm. Ah, äh, da unten haben Sie eine kleine Lücke. Ah, found it, okay. So, now just a quick poll. What did you feel while reading? Um, either captivation, embarrassment, or ease? <lacht> <laughs> yeah, that's what I expected. <laughs> okay, it's actually four twenty now. I'm I'm not mad at you if you leave, but um you can do it quietly. <laughs> How yeah. long will it take? Because I'm only 20 more minutes. Yeah, we're not going to manage that because there's a class after this one. So next week. <laughs> next week you're going to start. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. No. It's... How long do you need, roughly? I guess like five more minutes. All right, then go for it. Okay. <laughs> Good. So, um, I guess it's clear what we can see here. You were all embarrassed. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, the study that I mentioned earlier actually did this poll, but not about um, Fifty Shades of Grey uh, in particular, but uh, in general about um, erotic novels. And surprisingly, the bar of embarrassment is not that high, <laughs> as it's in our case. Um, we can see that most of the readers are actually captivated and read it with ease. Yeah, but I guess everyone is just uh, individual. Yeah. Um, what I also found interesting is that readers of um, erotic novels are mostly women in committed relationships. Um, they don't just uh, read uh, novels like we just read a minute ago, they read uh, all kinds, even same-sex erotic novels about only male protagonists um, and this literary pornography addresses female readership. Um, yeah. Um, there's another poll they made which shows that um, explicit wait, um, yeah, explicitness, explicitness is positively valued. Um, so I guess there could be a reason why Fifty Shades of Grey is so successful. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, I just listed some reasons to read erotic novels. They did another poll for that. Um, most of the participants just said that they read erotic novels to distract themselves um, yeah basically like with every other book um, for entertainment uh, because it provides a positive excitement and for distra distraction to escape everyday life and yeah special about erotic novels maybe that it can be also sexual stimulation and some women might see it as a substitute for pornography that is socially more accepted in a way, but others are uh, told that they use um, erotica as an inspiration and advice, somehow as a guidance and to get to know new practices and just to use the knowledge about the books to, as an opportunity to engage in conversations and discussions with their friends or maybe even in public. So it's a quite explosive topic. Um, 
And as you all know, Fifty Shades of Grey um, was also turned into movies. They were published in 2015, released, and that leads us to the next topic that Chiara will present uh, next week, which is sex and se sexuality in visual media. And that's it for today. I want to thank you for your attention and have a great uh, afternoon.